Nissan Super 3D. The all-new process that puts you in the picture. Whether you want to be there or not. It will scare you. Count on it. Friday the 13th, Part 3 in Super 3D. Rated R. Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 1982 slasher sequel, Friday the 13th, Part 3 in 3D. Now, Friday the 13th, Part 3 is the third installment in the Friday the 13th franchise. And Steve Miner returned to direct. He directed the last film, Friday the 13th, Part 2, uh, what's interesting is that there were plans initially to make a direct continuation to Friday Part 2. Uh, they wanted to bring back the character of Ginny and uh, wanted Amy Steele to return. And the idea was supposed to be a take on Halloween 2 where she's in a hospital or an asylum of some sorts because of the events uh that she survived through in the last film and jason was going to come back and he was going to attack people in the hospital but something happened either there was a miscommunication between amy Steele's agent and the studio or things just didn't really get communicated properly. Uh, I also heard there might have been a pay dispute or something. But regardless, uh, Amy Steele did not agree to come back. So then they had to start from scratch. And uh, they brought in a different pair of writers. in Martin Kratoser and Carol Watson to write a new screenplay. And they even brought in another screenwriter in uh, Petro... Popescu to do some rewrites because they weren't really that happy with what the the duo had put together. And for a film where they had to kind of scramble to get something together, it's not as bad as it could be, but at the end of the day, it's just a time waster for me. I, I think it's all right. I like it okay. I think my issue with this film is that it really did focus most of its energy and time on the 3D gimmick, and I honestly feel this film didn't really need the 3D gimmick. Uh, I, I think there are some deaths here that are honestly adversely impacted by the 3D gimmick, and it's just one of those things where... I guess if you saw it in the theater in 3D, it might have had more of an impact. And I have seen it on home video in 3D before, and it looks all right. But I don't know. It just seemed like it was one of those films where they didn't put as much effort into it as part two or even the first film or other films in the series because they were just focusing on the 3D gimmick. And... That also led to not very high quality performances by the cast in terms of the consistency of quality. And that's due to the fact that they weren't allowed to do more takes. They weren't allowed to do a retake on a line of dialogue if it didn't sound right. Because it was all about getting the 3D effect. It was all about getting that 3D shot. I think that also affected Steve Miner's direction because he was under a lot of pressure and he was not able to do retakes or take more risks as a filmmaker because of the fact that they didn't have time. It was a very quick production, down and dirty, so we need you to be on schedule and the, the main thing that we want is the 3D shots. We don't care about anything else. And as a result, there are a lot of shots in this film where it feels like the passion isn't there behind the camera. It really does feel like Steve Miner is lost and just adrift at times and just bobbing around in the water. 
And it, it's unfortunate. It really is. Because there are some shots in this that are impressive, that are on par with some of his work in part two. Uh, I really like the shot uh, at the end of the barn. It's a really nice looking wide shot of the barn as it zooms in on Jason's prone body. I like that shot a lot. And there are a few other shots here that are also fairly noteworthy. I, I think a lot of the kills, at least the ones that don't have to rely too much on a 3D gimmick, they definitely do have a certain punch to them as well, visually. But there's a lot of stuff here that just feels very bland to me in terms of the direction. And it does feel like He's just shuffling his feet or just going through the motions because it's one of those things where it's, I got to get the 3D shot. I got to get the 3D shot. And that's why I honestly wish this wasn't in 3D. I wish this was just a regular 2D film and it was never really more than that because I, I do feel the 3D gimmick while at times can be a little fun. At other times it's a little distracting and it's a little much but really where i would probably say the film's biggest problems lie though is with its pacing and with the way that the film is written in the first half of the screenplay the first half of the screenplay is honestly painfully dull it's really slow. There's not a lot that goes on when there is some kind of conflict. It's not really that engaging. I didn't really care about the biker gang. It did, they did nothing for me. Uh, the characters also seem like they take too long to break out of their shell or have their moments uh, where they are delivering a fun line of dialogue or having moments to shine when it comes to the chemistry with one another or showcasing their own inherent personalities. Uh, and a big part of that is due to the fact that they couldn't do another take in terms of dialogue due to the 3D emphasis, but also that the script just doesn't give them a lot to work with early on, other than maybe Shelley. But once the film gets going and once Jason gets his hockey mask, is interesting. that's honestly an interesting thing. The film really picks up the pace and really becomes quite fun and engaging when Jason gets his hockey mask. Uh, maybe that was the intention. I don't think that's the case. I think that was an unintentional thing. But I, I did find it quite interesting that that was the case. But yeah, the script, I just, I'm not really that big into the first half of the film. Uh, it takes too long to really kick into gear. Uh, the, the bits of character development they try to go with aren't really that interesting. The shenanigans aren't really that fun or um, worthwhile to me. I know this is uh, a lot of people's favorite of the franchise or one of their favorites and I think that's great. I think that's wonderful. But uh, I respectfully disagree. It's not bad. It's just there. It's just it's really just there for me. I just can't really get into the first half of it that much. And even in the second half, it, it does have some issues. Also, it does suffer from two leads that I'm not really that big on. I don't care for Chris that much. I really don't. I do feel for her because of the fact that she was attacked by Jason after she ran away from home previously to the events of the film where she and her friends go to some place near the camp to hang out. They go to a cabin and I do feel for her. I sympathize for her, but other than that, I just felt the character was really weak. 
the strongest that she ever got was when she's fighting Jason at the end. And that's really about it. Because other than that, there really wasn't much to this character other than her backstory of her being traumatized by Jason prior to her, to her heading to the cabin with her friends. It didn't help matters at all either that uh, the actress Dana Kimmel delivered a very subpar performance. The best acting she delivers is when she's acting scared and screaming her lungs out and being terrified of Jason. That's the best acting. When she's trying to show any amount of charisma or personality, she is awful. She's really bad, I'm sorry. Especially in comparison to Amy Steele or Adrian King. Just a massive step down from those two final girls. And you're left with her at the end of the film, but you're also left with Rick, who's a complete and total dead fuck to me. Just a dead-eyed zombie character... And by zombie character, I mean, he just, it just shambles around and really doesn't add much. He might as well just be a glorified extra. He has no charisma, no personality. He doesn't even have any chemistry with Dana Kimmel. It's really unfortunate that you're left with this guy, too, as one of the last two survivors. When you have characters like Debbie and Andy played by Tracy Savage and Jeffrey Rogers, who have a better connection. They play off each other really well. Why can't we just have them be the leads? I don't understand this franchise's issue with not wanting to have the best two characters to be the final two to face off against Jason, at least up until this point. I mean... It happened in the first film. It happened here. They got it right in part two, so you would think they would just continue that formula. But no. I, I don't I don't understand. Apparently Paul Kratka, who plays Rick, he auditioned for Andy, but they decided to, to cast him as Rick because they felt that he fit the character better. Right, do a rewrite. Fit, make things work better. Maybe Dana Kimmel would be stronger too if she isn't working with this plank of wood that is Paul Kratka. And there are other characters that I just didn't give a shit about, like Catherine Parks as Vera. She was a bitch. She really was. They they tried to write her as someone who's being nice to Shelley, but she's really just being a bitch. She puts him in the friend zone hard and then acts like she did nothing wrong later when he pranks her and scares her in the lake it's like what you you literally knocked him into the friend zone so hard he probably is in another dimension at that moment and you're acting like you did nothing wrong you literally told him after he said that he was into you that oh I, i'm not really I, i'm not i'm not really into that i'm sorry shelly uh maybe we can just talk like dude like damn like that's cold so no i don't like that character so when she got hit in the eye with a spear from Jason's spear gun, I didn't really give a shit. It was a good kill. I'll give it that. It's a nice visual. And Shelly, I actually liked his character arguably the most, other than uh, Debbie and Andy. I really liked Andy. I liked the fact that he did a lot of uh, walking on his hands. I thought that was different. And I would say my favorite character, though, the more I think about it, is Debbie. I really liked her. I liked her demeanor. I liked her sense of humor. Uh, I thought she was sexy. Uh, any gal who's willing to pick up a Fangoria magazine is a gal 
that I definitely want to spend some time with and I definitely want to get to know. So when she got the knife through the chest while she's sitting on the hammock reading the Fangoria magazine, that was that sucked. So I did feel for some of the characters here. So it's not like the film had no suspense or tension because I wasn't that into the characters as a whole. It's just the leads were bland and boring. And even the stoner characters I could deal with in uh, Rachel uh, Rachel ha Howard who played Chili and uh, I think it was David Katims who played uh, Chuck. Yeah, I, did, I didn't mind those, uh, those two. They had some nice lines of dialogue as well. Um, but yeah, it, it is a slasher film. It is a Friday the 13th movie. I'm not expecting Oscar-worthy acting by any means. But even on that regard, Dana Kimmel was really bad. There were a lot of lines where she was just flat as an ironing board. And... I think it's because of two factors. One, the uh, producers admitted that they were not casting based on talent. They were casting roles based on their appearance, which is always a mistake. I don't understand that. And two, once again, the 3D gimmick. Can't do another take if you deliver your line flatlined because... We got to get the 3D shot. We don't have time for anything else. But yeah. Performance wise. The cast is a mixed bag. But it's it's serviceable enough. And so is the characterization of the characters. You, I mean. I, I wish that they were able to break out of their shell earlier. And had better wittier lines of dialogue and banter earlier in the film rather than after the 40 minute mark but it is what it is and it's also one of those films where it really does satisfy your bloodlust once the body count starts to rise I have to be honest, it's got some really nice inventive kills. The spear gun through the eye, the guy who's walking on his hands and then gets hit with an axe, and then you see his chopped up body on, in the rafters. Um, a nice, clever reuse of Tom Savini's uh, arrow through the throat effect for the, the death of... Um, the character Debbie when the knife goes through her chest. Um, other memorable fun deaths. There's like a poker to the chest. Um, Rick gets his eye popped out of his head when he after he gets his head crushed by Jason. And of course you have the whole look of Jason here. This is when he gets his signature hockey mask. And it is. It's such an iconic and menacing look. And speaking of Jason, I want to definitely sing some praises for Richard Brooker, the late Richard Brooker. I, I really thought he did a fantastic job playing Jason. Uh, for a guy who was relatively skinny, he put on some padding and and still felt like he was a presence. He felt like he was a brick house, so to speak. This really tough, strong monster of a killer. Uh, I also like the fact that he shows moments of vulnerability, like when Jason is limping around. And I really like how he portrayed the character in terms of his physical strength. When he's going after Chris in the van while the van is stuck on the bridge and she's rolling the window up and he's got his arms stuck in the window and then he uses his head to headbutt the glass. I like that. I also like the fact that Jason is honestly kind of a troll in this because there's a scene where she thinks that she's hung him with a rope, but then she opens the barn door and he's still there and he's fine. 
He's not dead at all. He's still kicking. And he lifts his mask up just to give her a smile and almost a wink to just be like, yep, yep, bitch, I'm still here. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> I, I love that. That's great. Um, But yeah, good Jason. I would say Richard Brooker. I wouldn't say he's my favorite. My favorite is still uh, Kane Hodder from Part 7. Uh, but still a, a really formidable Jason Voorhees and one of the better uh, Jason Voorhees portrayals uh, in the franchise would have been nice to have seen him be Jason in part four, to be honest. Now the film has a score by Harry Manfredini as well as uh, Michael Zager, who did some music here and there and, uh, the score, once again, is pretty stock, pretty standard. A lot of the same cues. I'm not saying that the score by Manfredini from the first film is stock and standard. But th at this point, the cues are just being reused over and over again and recycled ad nauseum. So it does kind of start to get a little tiring you're wanting something new. That's why the disco theme in the opening credits and uh, during the end credits, that's one of the most memorable pieces from this score is because it's actually something different. And from a technical standpoint, the cinematography by Gerald Fell and the editing by George Hively, it's fairly lively and and well shot and well edited there's nothing about the film from a technical standpoint other than some of the 3d effects which look a little chintzy a little cheap a little uh obvious uh like scenes where the film has to stop for some guy to play with a yo-yo or juggle apples or do this other stuff where it's just like okay i get it you're in 3d but do we really need this what is this what purpose does this serve? I feel like you're wasting my time. Um, but there are other moments where that does work. But then there's other times where it probably looked good in 3D. But then when you think about it, it's disappointing. Like, for instance, uh, the kill, uh, really the last big kill when uh, Jason crushes Rick's head the eyeball pops out and it probably looked great in 3d probably made a bunch of audience members drop their popcorn but i just don't like the way that looks when you see it in 2d there's no blood there's no anything like w there's not like a spurt of blood that comes out like was he a literal airhead like wh where's the gore it's just it's so like that scene it's so bloodless, you could probably show it on USA. They probably did show it on USA Network when this uh, film aired on the USA Network back in the day. They probably showed that scene uncut because there's no blood. And speaking of effects, might as well mention Stan Winston's involvement with this film. Yes, the legend himself, Stan Winston. He did a makeup design for Jason's unmasked face and it was originally used for the film's original ending which was a different take on the dream ending where Dana Kimmel's character Chris she gets attacked by Jason and gets decapitated well apparently the producers didn't like the way that scene was shot or they didn't like the uh, the makeup effects. Really, they didn't like the design by Stan Winston. And I don't see what's so bad about it. I've seen photos of it. I don't think it looks bad at all. Uh, the design they went with here looks fine. But I don't see how it's demonstrably better than Stan Winston's design. I don't know why they scrapped that. I don't get it. It doesn't look laughable by any means and it would have been better to to have had the original ending she doesn't actually get decapitated because it's still a dream sequence 
but at least that would have been something different than just rehashing Jason's mom again. And then this weird clunky bit where she sees Jason smiling at her through the window while she's in a canoe on the lake. And then it appears as if he's going to come after her, but then she looks over and then he's gone. Okay. So that whole ending, the way that it's featured in this film falls incredibly flat because it seems like the complete and total prime example of a rushed shoot it really does like you can tell that that wasn't the original ending and they just came up with that on the fly and pulled it out of their ass so that's unfortunate and that definitely does hurt the film in in some way too and I just don't get why they didn't go with Stan Winston's design. I don't think it looks bad at all. I've seen people say it looks like Sloth. Hey, Sloth wasn't a thing. Sloth from the Goonies was not a thing in 1982. The Goonies didn't come out until years later. So I don't understand the criticisms against that makeup design. I think it looks quite good. And I would have liked to have seen the original ending. I wish that was kept in the film. Just like I wish this was not shot in 3D. I feel that it caused too many issues with lines of dialogue being delivered in ways that were very subpar and probably would have been done differently if there wasn't such an emphasis on the 3D effects. The direction would have been able to have been a little more dynamic, a little bit more unique in terms of the different angles or or different ways that Minor would work with a camera. And it would not have fixed all of the film's problems, but it would have helped. And I would say that it probably would have ultimately placed the film on the same level as part two for me personally. But because all of that is a part of this film's DNA, I just think it's all right. I think it's an okay film uh I, i'm not gonna say it's bad it's it's not really something that's worthy of a rant but it is a little disappointing at times i can understand why uh uncredited screenwriter petru popescu was really upset with the way that certain characters were handled he actually wanted to add some more depth and wanted to do something different and wanted to have uh some more unique casting he wanted to cast people more for their acting talents or at least he tried to bring that up but uh the producers were having none of it which is really unfortunate but uh yeah it's fine i mean for the film that gave jason his iconic mask i mean it definitely has a place in uh the franchise's history as well as in a lot of fans hearts and i 100% am always going to be thankful for this film for giving Jason his iconic look but this this was not the best entry in the series but it did continue a trend of somewhat enjoyable entertaining films I, I mean there hasn't been a single film in the franchise yet that I hated so that's uh, definitely a plus. Anyway, I don't know what else to say about Friday the 13th Part 3, except thanks for watching my review. And as always, I'll see you later. See ya.